in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in God's name. Today is the third Sunday of the Coptic month, Misra. And Misra is the last month in the Coptic year. And usually at the end of the Coptic year or at the end of the week, or at the end of the day, the church reminds us with the end of our life and the end of the world. One day our life will end and we will stand before God and we will give an account for our stewardship in order to be ready. So if we review the form Sundays of Misra. The first Sunday, the Gospel was about the parable of the wicked vine dressers. And the owner of the vineyard asked for fruits, but they were not ready. They didn't have any fruits for him. So the church is reminding us that at the end of our life, God will ask each one of us about the fruits that we have in our life. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Like when God gave the talents to his servants, one five talents, one uh, two talents, and one one talent, the person who got five talents he was fruitful and was able to bring other five talents. And the person who took two talents was able to bring two other talents. But the third person who buried the one talent and he was not fruitful, the Lord rebuked him and called him wicked and lazy servant. So in the first Sunday, the church is calling us to examine ourselves. What are the fruits we have right now? Are we ready to stand before God and to give an account for our stewardship? Then in the second Sunday, which is the last Sunday, the church gave us the example of Matthew, who was a tax collector. Tax collector means he is a greedy, a lover of money, violent, harsh in dealing with people. But God called him and transformed him and he became Saint Matthew, one of the 12 and one of the four evangelists. The first the gospel in the New Testament is the gospel of Saint Matthew. And the church actually chose Saint Matthew and the calling of Saint Matthew to tell us it is never too late even if you don't have fruit in, in your life, even if you are lover of money like St. Matthew before his conversion, or violent, your heart is harsh, but God is calling you. And God who worked in St. Matthew, who worked in St. Paul, who worked in St. Augustine, who worked in St. Paisa, who worked in St. Moses, is still able to work in you and transform you and change you so don't give up on yourself so last sunday was a message of hope to all of us the third sunday which is today in the same theme there are actually more than one lesson to us the first lesson your transformation and your conversion needs the power of God. You cannot do it by yourself. If you want to change your life, and if you want to have fruits, you cannot do it by yourself. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why the Lord said, no one can enter a strong man's house. Who is a strong man here? It is the devil. So, if the devil is controlling my life and I, I'm living a sinful life. 
no one actually can set me free from this house and plunder his goods. Plunder his goods mean to set free the slaves, the captives that were taken captive by Satan. On this, he first binds the strong man. So the strong man, Satan, has first to be bound. And no one can bind Satan except one, God, as he bound him on the cross. Then he will plunder his house. Then he will set free all the captives. So if I am taken captive by Satan, and until now I am not fruitful in my life, that's why I need to live before God and ask God to come to bind the strong man, to bind Satan, to remove his authority over me, and to set me free from this captivity by sin and by Satan. So the way to be free, the way to bear fruit is only to surrender and to submit to God in order to set you free. And the second message in the gospel of today, don't resist the voice of God. And the Lord told us all the sins, all blasphemies can be forgiven to the sons of men, except he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. And what's blasphemy again is the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit in us is to lead us to repentance. And the Lord said, when the Holy Spirit will come, will convict you of our sin, of our uh, righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit convict me, lead me to repentance. If I resist the voice of the Holy Spirit all my life and don't listen to him, that is the blasphemy again is the Holy Spirit. And this actually has no forgiveness, but the person is subject to eternal condemnation. So the second message in, in the Gospel of today, don't resist the Holy Spirit. Matthew, when the Lord told him, follow me, he left everything and followed him. But many times God tell me, follow me, but I resist, or I must fall or I delay my response. Until when? And the more actually I continue in sinful living, the more difficult for me to repent. That's why the Bible tells us, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, follow the Lord. Leave everything. Leave the pleasures of the world and follow the Lord. And the third message, also going with the same theme is the example of Saint Mary, the mother of God, especially around, usually around the third Sunday of Misra, we celebrate the Feast of Saint Mary, because the Feast of Saint Mary is the 16th of Misra, after two weeks from Misra, so usually comes with the third Sunday. While the Lord was teaching, Saint Mary and his brothers, and the brothers of Jesus, there are no interpre two interpretations. Saint Jerome said they are his cousins. Saint Mary had a sister, also her name was Mary, and she had children. So these children, the cousins of our Lord Jesus Christ, were called his brothers. But there is another tradition says that St. Joseph the carpenter was a widow and he had four sons. So these four sons are like step brothers to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have these two traditions, uh, but the church uh, agrees more with the tradition of St. Jerome but the other tradition also, if you read it in, with some early church fathers, uh, don't be surprised. So the two traditions can be correct. Either they are the children of Joseph, 
he was a widow before he killed the first son Mary, or he was, uh, or they are his cousins. So they told him, your mother and your brother outside. Then the Lord said, who is my mother or my brother? And then he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Many people, especially non-Orthodox, translate this part as if the Lord put down Saint Mary and he was not giving her any respect. And this is actually absolutely unacceptable interpretation. Because simply one of the Ten Commandments is to honor your father and mother. So how does the Lord actually break his own commandment and not respecting his mother? That's number one. And number two, actually, uh, who chose St. Mary to be mother of God? God himself. If St. Mary doesn't do the will of God, he wouldn't choose her. So how can we understand this verse? The Lord is telling them, why God chose St. Mary to be my mother? Because she is doing the will of God. And whoever, now God is expanding, whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So in order to be in God's family, in order to be member in the body of Christ, you need to do the will of God. And this is actually the way of repentance. When God called Matthew, he left everything, followed him, doing the will of God all the rest of his life. So if you want actually to be uh, in the family of God, learn from St. Mary. If you study the life of St. Mary, she never ever made a decision for herself. She never made a choice for herself. All the decisions were made by God and she was totally submissive to the will of God. From her birth, her parents presented her to the temple at her childhood. And she was have no choice in this. But this is the will of God she accepted. When she became 14 or 15 and decided to cross her, they, and they chose St. Joseph to her. She did not make this a choice, but she accepted this. She chose one thing to live the life of virginity. And as a person vowed her life for perpetual virginity, she never imagined she would be pregnant and have a child. But again, even this choice, yes, we believe in the perpetual virginity of St. Mary. She was virgin before, during, and after the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. But again, when God sent Archangel Gabriel to tell her that you're going to be pregnant and have a child, you're going to conceive, she accepted this in total surrender to the will of God. And she said, behold, the handmaid of the world. She didn't choose to go to Egypt in this very difficult trip. But when God sent the angel to Joseph to tell him, to go to Egypt, and so on. Even at the cross, the Lord did not ask her, with whom do you like to live after my ascension? No, he told her, Mary or mother, this is your son. And he looked at Jonah and told him, John, this is your mother. So Saint Mary lived all her life submissive to the will of God, 100%. That's why God looked from heaven and he did not find anyone like her and he chose her to be his mother. And each one of us, we can be in the family of God if we do the will of God. For whoever does the will of God is my brother 
and my sister and mother. And I want to make your attention, he did not say my father here. He did not say for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my mother and my sister and my father. No, he said my brother, my sister and mother. Because the father is God the father. There is no other father for him except God the father. And no one can call he is a father to Jesus except God the father. So, uh, so today in the third Sunday uh, of Misra, the church, after telling us, examine yourself to see if you have fruit or not, and put in front of us the example of Saint Matthew, who, when he called, he accepted the calling of God, and his life is completely transformed. So, in the third Sunday, the church is telling us, don't resist the calling of God the rest of your life, otherwise this is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And you need actually to surrender to the will of God, because you need God to bind Satan in order to set you free. Next Sunday, and the Sunday after, you know, after Shabbat and the month of Misra, there is a very, very small month, five days. And usually there is one Sunday comes during these five days. So during the last two Sundays of the Catholic year, the fourth Sunday of Misra, and the Sunday that falls during the little month, the reading about the end of the world, to prepare us to think about to stand before God. Are we ready for this moment or So these are the meaning of the readings of the fourth Sunday of Misra. I like to speak today a few minutes about how the Lord dealt with criticism. When they told him uh, he has banned the book and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. All of us many times we face criticism. People criticize us and usually or most of us we become defensive, we become emotional, and sometimes we attack them. But let us see how the Lord Jesus Christ handled criticism. And I want you to put your place, yourself in this place, just for a few minutes. Can you imagine if somebody comes to you and tells you, you have Ba'ali Zabu. You are by the ruler of the demons, cast out demons, or acting or behaving, etc. How would you react to this accusation? I'm sure most of us would be very defensive, very angry, attacked back, uh, emotional, etc. But let us see how the Lord Jesus Christ reacted. He called to them and start with logic to respond to them. He told them, how can Satan cast out Satan? <coughs> if a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, he is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. So the Lord told them, let us think about it in a logical way. Satan wants to spread his kingdom on earth. So if Satan is casting out Satan, how his kingdom will spread? So this accusation has no ground. It is out of hatred. But he didn't tell them even it is out of hatred. But he told them it has no ground. Uh, just I will mention a comment and come back to, to criticism. Unfortunately, some secular therapists in treating homosexuality, they advise the people to watch pornography of heterosexual in order to switch them from being homosexual to heterosexual. But again, if we listen to what the Lord said today, 
Satan cannot cast out Satan. Satan of pornography cannot cast out the Satan of homosexuality. So, definitely, this type of therapy is absolutely wrong and absolutely unacceptable. I cannot go to another demon to cast the first demon. The only one who can bind the strong man and, and, and Satan and cast is Jesus Christ. So just because I heard that some therapist using this technique, I, that, that's why I just I want to say, Satan cannot cast out Satan. Demon cannot cast out demon. The Satan or the devil of, of pornography cannot cast out the demon of homosexuals. Going back to criticism. So, when actually you are criticized, number one, don't get emotional, but handle it by logic and by spirituality, like the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be defensive, don't attack back, but use reason and use your spiritual life in order to respond to the attack. Number two, examine yourself. Maybe the criticism has some truth in it, or all of it is true. Like Nathan, when he rebuked uh, David, it was true. And David was not defensive. David said, I have sinned against the Lord. So if there is truth, partially or totally, thank God that he sent you somebody to lead you to the way of repentance. Don't act like Herod when he was criticized by John the Baptist, he killed him. Uh, number three, even if the person is not convinced that the Pharisees and the scribes were not convinced by what the Lord told them, and at the end they crucified him, it's not your responsibility to convince the other. Just say the truth. And it's up to them to believe you or not to believe you. The Lord did not actually pressure them to believe that he doesn't have bad as a rule. He said the truth. And they did not believe him, by the way. They, they conspired to uh, kill him. But it is not your responsibility to convince the other. You say the truth, and that's it. Uh, number four. Pray for those who criticize you, especially falsely. When you receive a false accusation from somebody, this person needs prayer. He doesn't need to attack him back or to be angry with him or to abandon him. Rather, he needs your prayer. All of us who need prayers, all of us who have weaknesses. And number five, don't use social media for criticism. Social media is not for criticism, but social media is just for people to socialize with each other in, in a dark way. It, 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 it's a damage that happens, but when you use social media in criticism, is more than what you want to achieve. Number six, you yourself, before you make a criticism about somebody, examine your motive first. What's your motive behind this criticism? Is your motive godly, or revenge, or popularity? What's your motive? Is this coming from God, or coming from yourself, or coming from the devil? And also, examine the style you are using in criticism. Actually, are you using a spiritual and godly style or ungodly and demonic style in criticizing others? Remember, many times the Lord responded to the people to criticism and many times he was silent. So, there is a wisdom when I choose to be silent and when I choose to respond. For example, 
Here the Lord responded to them, but in a very logical way. But during the trial, when Pontius Pilate asked him, when Herod uh, questioned him, he did not respond. When the uh, high priests uh, asked him in the trial, he did not respond. So ask God to give you wisdom to uh, differentiate and to discern when to choose to be silent, when to choose to respond. And the last point, uh, we say to God, if you count our iniquities, who can stand before you? If God actually is counting all our iniquities, nobody can stand before him. So as God let go of many iniquities in our life, we need actually to let go also of the weaknesses of others, especially me, myself, I am weak too. So don't criticize for every single thing, whether criticize your spouse, or criticize your sibling, or your friends. Some people actually, they don't let go of any small weakness. Once you meet them, they have a list of how to improve yourself and what you are doing bad. That's not right, especially in marriage. <coughs> especially in marriage, this can be destructive to the marriage. So choose wisely when to speak and when to make a criticism, and this criticism should be constructive one after you examine the motive in your heart. But if you are living with somebody who usually, usually remind you how bad you are, what did you do wrong, then actually you are sitting, if this marriage, you are sitting this marriage to failure. Don't be a difficult person, but be an easy going person. So to be meek, to be gentle, to be lovable by everyone. In, in order actually uh, uh, to be loved, you need to make it easy on others to love you and to communicate with you. So let's learn how the Lord Jesus Christ dealt today with criticism in order to know how to deal with criticism and also when we want to criticize, let us follow the right uh, method to criticize for the edification of everyone. Glory be to God. Forever and ever. Mm.